So welcome everyone. Uh, I'm going to get started just with my introduction as folks are still joining us. So good evening. I'm Arielle Cates. I'm the Director of Programming at Village Preservation. I'm so glad that you're all here with us this evening. Um, so just a little bit about Village Preservation. We have been documenting, celebrating, and fighting for the preservation of Greenwich Village, the East Village, and NoHo since 1980. We work to expand and extend landmark and zoning protections and stop inappropriate development while also encouraging appropriate development in our neighborhoods. We conduct roughly 75 programs a year, all of which are now virtual and most of which are free and open to the public. Our events are meant to illuminate the cultural and architectural heritage, history and depth and the value of preservation in our communities. We are a nonprofit membership based organization. So your involvement and support mean the world to us. You can learn more at our wonderful new website, villagepreservation.org. And please consider becoming a member or making a donation if you're able at villagepreservation.org slash donate. So just a little bit of Zoom protocol. I will be here during the talk, even though I won't be visible. So feel free to chat me if you have any issues or thoughts. Um, we're likely not going to take questions following the talk, um, but if I can clarify anything, again, feel free to use the chat. So without further ado, I am so pleased to introduce our speaker for this evening. Francis Moroni is an architectural historian and a writer and the author of 11 books, including Guide to New York City Urban Landscapes, and with Henry Hope Reed, The New York Public Library, The Architecture and Decoration of the Stephen A. Schwartzman Building, which I believe we are looking at, um, as well as architectural guidebooks to Brooklyn and Philadelphia and more. He has written countless papers and reports on the historic architecture of the Northeastern United States. He was for six and a half years an art and architecture critic for the New York Sun. Francis Moroni is the recipient of the Landmarks Lion Award of the Historic Districts Council, the Arthur Ross Award of the Institute of Classical Architecture, and New York University's Excellence in Teaching Award. And Travel and Leisure Magazine named him one of the 13 best tour guides in the world. So without further ado, Francis, take us away. Thank you, Ariel, very much, and good evening, everybody. It's um, a great pleasure for me to be able to speak about Willa Cather. Um, I don't get to speak about Willa Cather that often. Uh, I'm an architectural historian, but I also have a very, very uh, strong scholarly interest in Edith Wharton, which has been dominating my life lately and will dominate my life over the next several years. But the truth is, um, and maybe I shouldn't say this, um, but the truth is that Willa Cather is my favorite writer, not Edith Wharton. Willa Cather is my favorite novelist in the world. Um, I, she's above Tolstoy. Uh, I just absolutely adore Willa Cather, every sentence that Willa Cather has ever written. How is that? And uh, to speak about her in relation to New York is something which I'm not the first to do by any means. Uh, as I was telling Ariel just a little while ago, before we began, uh, the Willa Cather scholarly community is one of the most thorough that I have ever encountered. Uh, the amount of research that has gone into Willa Cather's life and works, not least her life in New York City, is very, very impressive, and I've drawn on that extensively for tonight's talk, as well as including some things that I hope are original with me. So um, let me just very quickly say what I'm going to do. I'm going to speak about her in relation to her New York City residences. This is going to be mostly about Greenwich Village, as is appropriate given the sponsor of the talk, but I'm going to also go beyond Greenwich Village and talk about 
or life in the city as a whole. Uh, I'm organizing this by residence, beginning with 60 Washington Square South and working our way up to Park Avenue and 63rd Street, where, um, which was her final residence. Uh, and along the way, I'll be talking about um, her relationship to the city and about her works, which are set in the city. Uh, particularly two works. Uh, her great uh, long short story called Coming Aphrodite, which is her Greenwich Village story, and then her incredible novella, My Mortal Enemy, which uh, is set partly in New York City in and around Madison Square. Now, I am not going to presume that you, everybody in this audience, has read both of these. Uh, my hope is that if you've not read them, then after this talk, you will read them. You must read them. Um, but, uh, and so, uh, with the presumption that many of you will have not read either or both of them, um, I'm uh, going to speak about them in, in, in that way. I'm going to assume that you haven't read them. Along the way, I'm going to do something that I don't normally do in lectures because people hate it. Uh, and I'm going to uh, read some brief passages from the works. Um, I'll have the words up on the screen when I do that. You needn't really concern yourself with reading along because I will read what is on the screen. I hope that this works. As I say, this is generally something you don't do in an illustrated lecture. I'm going to do it uh, because her words are what matter more than anything else. And I wanted to include her words in this. So let's begin. Willa Cather's New York. First of all, uh, again, lots of verbiage on the screen. Don't worry about it. These are her five New York City residences. You know, people who are just coming to an interest in Willa Cather's works, or people who know Willa Cather primarily because you were forced to read My Antonia in high school. Um, and by the way, I was and consequently uh, kind of ignored Willa Cather for a good many years after that because any sensible person pretty much ignores the writers that he was forced to read in high school until such a day and you realize, actually, th th that was great stuff. And um, in any event, uh, such a person is likely to associate Willa Cather with Nebraska, or if you've read Death Comes to the Archbishop with New Mexico, um, you don't automatically think Willa Cather uh, a New York writer. But indeed she was. She spent most, not all, but most of her adult life in New York City, and a great portion of that in Greenwich Village, beginning at 60 Washington Square South. I've listed the books that she wrote at each of these addresses, or largely wrote at these addresses. She actually wrote all over the place. She often went away to write, uh, rather than doing it in her apartment in New York. But these are the books, at any rate, that were prepared and published while she lived at each of the addresses, and will be repeating this, so don't worry about getting it all right now. Let's begin here at 60 Washington Square South. This is a photograph from 1923 uh, showing the house that she lived in. It was, it was built, um, the houses that once were ranged along the south side of Washington Square, just like the houses that are still standing on the north side of the square, these were built as single-family residences, um, pretty much 
upper class, upper middle class, we may say single family residences with living servants and what have you, but as has been the fate of most New York City row houses, um, they were turned into multiple dwellings at some point, rooming houses. And indeed, that's what this was when Willa Cather moved in in 1906. You can see on this map that the house was between uh, Thompson Street, and it says in the 1916 Bromley map, West Broadway. That portion of West Broadway is today called LaGuardia Place. Uh, so she was between LaGuardia Place and Thompson. She was just steps away from Judson Memorial Church. She was, we know, a very great admirer of John Lafarge's great mural in the Church of the Ascension, which I'll show in a bit. What I don't know and would like to know if, is if she was also an admirer of Lafarge's windows at Judson Memorial Church, which is the single greatest collection of Lafarge glass to be found anywhere in the world. Um, but we just have to sort of leave that to speculation. Um, there is Washington Square, with which she was very familiar, uh, and which is uh, the setting of the great story, Coming Aphrodite, which we'll get to in a minute. You can see from this map that the fountain is still off center. It's not lined up with the arch as it has been since the early 2000s in the renovation of Washington Square. Here is our clearer picture of 60 Washington Square South. She lived there from 1906 to 1908. She came to New York um, to work for McClure's Magazine. One house to the left of 60 Washington Square South is 61 Washington Square South, the so-called House of Genius, as um, people like to call it. Um, just let me get this out of my system, everybody, if you will. Um, there is so much nonsense written about 61 Washington Square South. And the problem with um, nonsense in the internet age is that something gets repeated on a website, something gets said on a website, and then it just sort of uh, uh, proliferates. So that, for example, if you were to Google 61 Washington Square South, pretty much like the first couple of hundred things that you would come up with in that Google search would tell you that everybody from, you know, Theodore Dreiser to Ho Chi Minh lived at 61 Washington Square South. Uh, and it, it's, it's, it's amazing that the uh, people who get added to the roster of 61 Washington Square South. Um, Stephen Crane lived at Washington, 61 Washington Square South. Not only did Stephen Crane live there, he wrote the Red Badge of Courage there. And this is all uh, unsubstantiated and largely untrue. Um, so uh, let's forget about 61 Washington Square South. And by the way, um, get it out of your head right away that Willa Cather lived there because lots of sources say she did. She did not. She lived next door at 60 Washington Square South. She had a room. It was very uh, meager accommodations. It's bathroom down the hall, um, all of that sort of thing. Very, as we like to say, bohemian. She uh, moved in there because of friend of hers from Nebraska, somebody whom she had met a few years earlier named Edith Lewis lived there. And Willa, who'd been living in Pittsburgh, she grew up, she was born, by the way, in Virginia, but she uh, 
then moved with her family to Nebraska. She attended the University of Nebraska in Lincoln, Nebraska. And after that, she moved to Pittsburgh, where she worked as a journalist and then as a school teacher. But during the Pittsburgh years, she visited New York. And when she did, she stayed with her friend, Edith Lewis, at 60 Washington Square South. So it made a certain amount of sense that Willa would take a room in 60 Washington Square South. She did not share that room with Edith Lewis. They did not become uh, living partners until they moved um, from 60 Washington Square South. 60 Washington Square South was, together with the rest of its historic block, demolished um, um, partly in the 1920s, partly in the 1940s, and then that block remained an empty lot for years, as you can see from this 1953 photograph looking south across Washington Square. There's the block, and it is empty. The reason it's a long story and probably not germane uh, to tonight's lecture, but uh, the block was acquired by a New York City developer named Anthony Campagna, a man the preservation community loves to hate uh, because he kind of demolished a lot of landmark quality buildings, but he had intended to build an apartment house on the site. Robert Moses, however, thought that it would be a nice gesture for NYU to own the site, and he called up Anthony Campania and said, you know, I'd like you to sell the site at a reasonable uh, price to NYU. Anthony Campania, this is Robert Moses. So he said, sure. NYU, however, at that moment had nothing, as we say, shovel ready. And they wouldn't for some time with the result that, look at that, it was just empty. Um, eventually, NYU built the Loeb Student Center uh, and the Catholic Center on that site, neither of which buildings still exist because they've been replaced. And what we now have on the site is NYU's Kimball Center, which opened in 2003. There is a new Center for Academic and Spiritual Life to its um, west, but actually the site of 60, number 60, where Willa lived, and I'm going to be calling her Willa. I don't mean to uh, assume such familiarity, but it's easy. Uh, Willa, uh, where Willa lived, is actually on the footprint of Kimmel Center. As I say, she came here to work for McClure's magazine. McClure's was a major American magazine. Uh, think something on the order of the Atlantic Monthly, except that at its height, uh, McClure's was a magazine that was most associated with what was called muckraking journalism. Uh, some of you perhaps have read the book The Bully Pulpit by Doris Kearns Goodwin, which is uh, in large part about the muckrakers at McClure's Magazine and their relationship to the progressive political movement, especially Theodore Roosevelt at the time. Um, so was Willa Cather a McClure's muckraker? Actually, well, she was to some extent, but the truth is that is that she came on board at McClure's just as the muckraking heyday was coming to an end, the heyday that we associate with such journalists as Lincoln Steffens and Ida Tarbell and Ray Stannard Baker, who were the big names at McClure's, they had all actually just left McClure's when Samuel McClure, the proprietor, uh, engaged the services of Willa Cather. In any event, she went to work for McClure's in 1906. Uh, in 1908, she was promoted to manager, which means that she held uh, a major job in the journalistic world of New York City. During the time that she was working for McClure's, this is where she worked. This is the building. It's still standing. 
This was um, 44 to 60 East 23rd Street. This is the southwest corner of Park Avenue South. Uh, and Forest Magazine was headquartered in this building from 1984 to 1929. Willa worked in this building as did Francis, yes. I'm I'm sorry to um, I'm so so sorry to interrupt you. It seems like your audio is sort of going in and out. It seems like if you're it really yeah, if if you're a little bit closer, it seems like it's coming through really well, and then occasionally. So I just think thanks. I just wanted to let you know. I shall sit closer. I appreciate it. How is this? Sounds good to me. Okay, so uh, McClure's was in this building from 1904 to 1929. This is Samuel Sidney McClure, S.S. McClure, uh, whose magazine this was. He's himself the subject of an hour-long lecture. Suffice it to say, he was a bit of a character in the New York of his day. Uh, he was just a tremendously energetic man, a dynamo, built McClure's into this uh, tremendous enterprise, but he was also a little bit crazy. Uh, and consequently, uh, he managed um, to lose McClure's. And McClure's Magazine continued as McClure's Magazine well after S.S. McClure had anything to do with the magazine. He was pretty much forced out, but he was also a book publisher. And before Wella moved to New York, uh, he actually published her first book of stories. Uh, this is when Willa still lived in Pittsburgh, uh, when S.S. McClure, the book publishing arm of his publishing empire, McClure Phillips and Company, published The Troll Garden which actually contains several stories that are very well known that were later reprinted in other collections, like Paul's Case, which is a wonderful New York story. Uh, but uh, when Willa first came to New York, she did not move in 1906. She did not move directly into 60 Washington Square South. Won't get into the reasons for that. She moved into the Hotel Griffou which was located on West 9th Street. In these buildings that are, these row houses from the 1850s that are still standing. Uh, this was a French hotel. Um, and she uh, actually kept a room here for several uh, months. And if you read what I have written here, our later, not latter, sorry about the misspelling. They were dining in the back garden of a little French hotel on 9th Street, long since passed away. That comes from her story, Coming Aphrodite, um, in which the two main characters in that story, Don Hedger and Eden Bauer, uh, go to dine at this little French hotel on 9th Street, which was clearly modeled on the Hotel Griffou. Coming Aphrodite uh, is the story, it was published in 1920. Its original title, when it appeared in the magazine, Smart Set. That was the magazine that was edited by H.L. Mencken, who was a major supporter of Willa Cather um, and George Jean Nathan. Um, it was called by a different title. It was called Coming Eden Bauer. Eden Bauer is the name of the main female character in this story. But when the story came out in book form as part of the story collection published by Knopf in 1920, just a little bit after its magazine appearance, the collection was called Youth and the Bright Medusa, um, the title was changed, and some of the content was changed as well. It was now called Coming Aphrodite, with an exclamation uh, mark. This is a facsimile of uh, 
page from the first draft. I just thought you might like to see Willa Cather's handwriting. Um, by the way, I'm, I may not look it, but I'm old enough that I wrote my first book in longhand. Um, but uh, but uh, it's been a long time since I or anyone I know has done that. But there, there you are. Um, now, this is uh, a quote uh, from, from the story. Let me just set it up. Don Hedger is a painter. And this is, of course, um, set in the first decade of the 20th century. So we're talking about uh, Bohemian Greenwich Village. He lives in a rooming house on the south side of Washington Square. And that rooming house is very clearly modeled on 60 Washington Square South. So Don Hedger had lived for four years on the top floor of an old house on the south side of Washington Square, and nobody had ever disturbed him. He occupied one big room with no outside exposure except on the north, where he had built in a many built in a many paned studio window that looked upon a court and upon the roofs and walls of other buildings. His room was very cheerless. Since he never got a ray of direct sunlight, the south corners were always in shadow. In one of the corners was a closed closet built against the partition, in another a wide divan serving as a seat by day and a bed by night. In the front corner, the one farther from the window was a sink and a table with two gas burners where he sometimes cooked his food. There too, in the perpetual dusk, was the dog's bed and often a bone or two for his comfort. And then we're introduced to um, Eden Bauer, a singer, an opera singer, who moves into the rooming house in the room adjoining Don Hedger's room. Early in May, Hedger learned that he was to have a new neighbor in the rear apartment. Two rooms, one large and one small, that faced the west. His studio was shut off from the larger of these rooms by double doors, which, though they were left him a good deal at the mercy of the occupant. The rooms had been leased long before he came there by a trained nurse who considered herself knowing all furniture. She went to often things and bought out mahogany and dirty grass and stored it away there, stored it away here, where she meant to live when she retired from nursing. Meanwhile, she sublet her rooms with their precious furniture to young people who came to New York to write who proposed to live by the sweat of the brow rather than of the hand and who desired artistic surroundings. So this is the first decade of the 20th century. And what we are talking about here is, well, the word would not be coined for another half century, but it's gentrification. Because this was, by that time, as you all know, an Italian immigrant tenement neighborhood. And it was a very inexpensive neighborhood. And for the young artists moving in, the lure was in part below rents. But don't be deceived. The artists were paying more than the immigrants were paying. They may not have had much money, but they had more money. They came with more money. Hedger actually is fairly successful. When he needs money, he's able to do commercial work. He's not a pauper by any means. He's not an artist starving in his garret. That's not Don Hedger. Eden Bauer is actually somebody who is backed in her career by a Chicago billionaire. So they have more money far more money than their immigrant neighbors. Not something that uh, Willa Cather um, uh, is explicit about in the story, but it is something that I think many of us catch uh, as, we're, as we're reading it. By the way, the name Eden Bauer, interesting name, is it not? But uh, it's pretty clear to me that uh, Willa Cather took it from the poem Eden's Bower, 
by Dante Gabriel Rossetti. It was Lilith, the wife of Adam, Eden bowers in flower, not a drop of her blood was human, but she was made like a soft, sweet woman. The poem is about the mythical Lilith, the first wife of Adam, and later the, in some variants of the story, the devil's wife, and a terrible ensnarer of men. This is uh, Dante Gabriel Rossetti's painting of uh, Lady Lilith, which is in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And what's interesting is that a later version of this poem became part of Dante Gabriel Rossetti's book of poems called The House of Life, which is noted by Edith Wharton in The Age of Innocence as being one of Newland Archer's favorite books. So she may be suggesting that the Countess Olenska is a Lilith-like character in the same way that Eden Bauer in Coming Aphrodite is a Lilith-like character. So when exactly does Coming Aphrodite take place? The one clue that we're given in the story is when Don Hedge is when it says that it was quote, almost the last summer of the old horse stages in Fifth Avenue. Now, the last summer of the horse drawn omnibuses or horse stages in Fifth Avenue was 1907. So, does the story take place in 1907? Well, there's that qualifier, almost the last summer. What the heck does that mean? Does it mean 1906 um, or, or what? So let us say circa 1906-07 is when this takes place, which sort of helps us to set it. This would be, though the photo is from 1917, still pretty much the view north from Washington Square from south of the arch, from 60 Washington Square South North. You see that the nearest tall building is pretty distant. Um, the Hotel Brevort appears in the story, as it appears in the old passage part. Um, Don and Edith begin a relationship, dine together at the Hotel Brevort. Um, this is the Brevoort dining room. Indeed, Willa Cather and Edith Lewis uh, were frequenters of the Brevoort dining room. Um, indeed, when they lived on uh, Washington Place, their first home together, uh, after they, the two had moved from 60 Washington Square South, um, Willa suggested once that they had dinner, the two of them at the Brevoort dining room four nights a week. Uh, so this was a place that was intimately familiar to Willa. Now, at the end of the story, uh, Don and Eden have had an affair, uh, but they find that their artistic visions are incompatible. Don is a painter who has, we're told, studied and he's deeply serious about his art. And he looks down. Yes, Ariel? Sorry. I'm, I'm wondering, it might help to center yourself a little bit more. It seems like when you're more towards the edges, the audio cuts out. Okay. Um, Thank you so much. Sorry. Yeah, it's strange. I don't normally have that problem. You, um, you sound great to me now. All right. Shall we start over? <laughs> um, so, um, so Don is a purist, uh, and he looks down on people who he feels are selling out to commerce, whereas Eden has dreams of her name and lights and her name on page six and um, great wealth and so on, which indeed, after the two of them part, Eden goes off to Europe to study and perform. Don remains in Washington Square 
um, um, Eden becomes very famous. But then she's visiting New York 18 years later. She's had nothing to do with Don in all of that time. Coming Aphrodite, this is a quote from the story. This legend and electric lights over the Lexington Opera House had long announced the return of Eden Bauer, the famous Eden Bauer, to New York after years of spectacular success in Paris. By the way, Aphrodite was an opera by Camille Allanger, which premiered in 1906. She came at last under the management of an American opera company, but bringing her own chef d'orchestre. One bright December afternoon, Eden Bauer was going down Fifth Avenue in her car on the way to her broker in William Street. Her thoughts were entirely upon stocks. This shows us who she now was. When she suddenly looked up and realized that she was skirting Washington Square. She had not seen the place since she rolled out of it in an old-fashioned four-wheeler to seek her fortune 18 years ago. Arrêtez, Alphonse, attendez-moi, she called and opened the door before he could reach it. The children who were streaking over the asphalt on roller skates saw a lady in a long fur coat and short high-heeled shoes alight from a French car and pace slowly about the square, holding her muff to her chin. This spot, at least, had changed very little, she reflected. The same trees, the same fountain, the white arch, and over yonder, Garabal drawing the sword for freedom. There, just opposite her, was the old red brick house, 60 Washington Square South. Yes, that is the place, she was thinking. I can smell the carpets now, and the dog. What was his name? That grubby bathroom at the end of the hall, and that dreadful hedger. Still, there was something about him, you know? She glanced up and blinked against the sun. From somewhere in the crowded quarter south of the square, a flock of pigeons rose, wheeling quickly upward into the brilliant blue sky. She threw back her head, pressed her muff closer to her chin, and watched them with a smile of amazement and delight. So they still rose out of all that dirt and noise and squalor, fleet and silvery, just as they used to rise that summer when she was 20. There's Garibaldi. Some people think this the worst statue in New York, but he's still there. And this is the Lexington Opera House. That was a real place. It was a theater, a very large one, something like 2,600 seats on Lexington and 51st, built by Oscar Hammerstein I. And it later became a movie theater, as we see in this picture, Lowe's Lexington. But uh, indeed, this is where a great soprano of her day named Mary Garden performed in the title role of Alanger's Aphrodite in its American premiere on February 27, 1920. And Mary Garden, it is said by many, was the model for Eden Bauer. Mary Garden was one of the great figures of her day, associated very strongly with Chicago, um, which is where much of her career took place, but she was internationally famous. And um, we may um, uh, infer that uh, Eden Bauer looks an awful lot like Mary Garden. When the story was, uh, when Youth and the Bright Medusa, the book, came out, it was reviewed in the New York Times book review by one of the leading book reviewers of the day, Edmund Lester Pearson, who was also a librarian, director of publications at the New York Public Library. And he wrote, if Willa Cather had written nothing except coming Aphrodite, there could be no doubt of her right to rank beside the greatest creative artists of the day. Wow. But I think he's right. So read the story if you've not done so. Now, at around the same time the coming Aphrodite takes place, if uh, my assumption is correct that it is circa 06, 07, then this is also around the time of the publication of Henry James's The American Scene, meaning that he'd been to Washington Square 
only a year before. And he wrote about that visit to Washington Square. And he had not been there in an awfully long time, the expatriate Henry James. These were the felicities of the backward reach, he wrote, which, however, had also its melancholy checks and snubs, nowhere quite so sharp as in presence, so to speak, of the rudely, the ruthlessly suppressed birth house on the other side of the square. He was born on Washington Place and Green Street. That's the birthplace to which he refers. That was where the pretense that nearly nothing was changed had most to come in. For a high square and personal structure proclaiming its lack of interest with a crudity all its own, so blocks at the right moment for its own success the view of the past, that the effect for me in Washington Place was of having been amputated of half my history. His birth house had been torn down, and it had been replaced by this, the building that is still there today, a loft building. And boy, was this offensive to Henry James. Also, this is right at around the same time that Edith Wharton's novel, The Custom of the Country, takes place, a portion of which is set in the houses on the north side of Washington Square. So if you read Coming Aphrodite, you get what life was like on the south side of the square, which was a combination of Italian immigrant and Bohemian artist. And if you read Edith Wharton's The Custom of the Country, you see what life was like on the north side of the square, which was still very upper class, if a bit long in the tooth, upper class. And as people like to say, aristocratic, the families, the Dagonets and the Marvells in The Custom of the Country live in houses that were modeled after those of the Rhinelanders and Stuarts to whom Edith Wharton was related. Those were on the west side of Fifth Avenue, and these are the houses, the ones that you see in this picture, which were demolished for two Fifth Avenue. This is what Willa Cathard looked like at the time coming Aphrodite was published. This is her passport photo. There's 61 Washington Square South. I don't, oh, the reason I showed that again this is neither here nor there, really. But one of the famous residents of 61 Washington Square South, one whom we know lived there, was an artist. To me, a wonderful uh, commercial artist named Rose O'Neill, whose works appeared in Ladies Home Journal. She was the inventor of the Cupid doll in the pages of Ladies Home Journal, but she became an enormously successful artist. It is said the highest paid woman artist in America. She was rich and she actually owned several homes, but she never gave up her home at 61 Washington Square South. So in a way, she's kind of like a combination of Don and Eden. She um, didn't, like Eden, leave Washington Square South when she became rich. She actually stayed there for a great many years, almost 20 years, during which she was quite rich. This is Edith Lewis. Edith Lewis and Willa Cather met in Lincoln, Nebraska in 1903. Edith moved to New York City very shortly thereafter while Willa was in Pittsburgh. And when Willa came to New York, Edith was her close friend in the city. And the two of them became very intimate. They became indeed partners. And in 1908, the two of them decided to get an apartment together. They had lived in separate rooms in 60 Washington Square South, and now together they took an apartment in a fairly new building right around the corner on Washington Place, 82 Washington Place. There you are. It was built in 1903. They moved in in 1908, and it was a big step up for them from the rooming house. This was a 
big modern apartment building at the time. They were moving on up, um, so to speak. They lived there from 1908 to 1912. And here is a mural by Edward Sorrell, which I am sure many of you are familiar with. It's in the Waverly Inn restaurant on Bank Street, which is actually practically right across the street from where another of Willa's and Edith's homes once stood. But in this mural, Edward Sorrell depicts village characters. And we see the three women, more or less in the center, are from left to right, Willa Cather in the red tie, and then Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney in the middle, and Jane Jacobs on the right. So Willa Cather is dancing with Jane Jacobs. Why is this apt? Because between 1944 and 47, one of the residents of that same building, 82 Washington Place, was the then Jane Butzner, a journalist who only moved out of 82 Washington Place when she married the architect Robert Hyde Jacobs and became Jane Jacobs. So is it not simply wonderful that Willa Cather and Jane Jacobs, though in very different eras, lived in the same apartment building, 82 Washington Place? It's around that time that Willa was photographed by the Aimé Dupont studio, which was known as the official photographer for the Metropolitan Opera Company, meaning that they were best known for their photographs, their portraits of operatic divas. And Willa was a tremendous fan of the opera indeed an obsessive fan of the opera, as readers of her books know, and that she was photographed by these opera photographers is a wonderful thing. These are the most glamorous photographs of Willa that were ever made. She almost looks herself like she could be a diva. And this is another one uh, from that same studio dated 1912. And 1912 is the year that her first novel was published and that she severed ties with McClure's magazine. She wanted to write full time. She was in a position where she had saved up money and she had enough contacts that she was able to publish novels as well as the stories and poems and reviews that she had thus far been publishing and the Boston publisher, Houghton Mifflin, published Alexander's Bridge. Not her greatest novel, but her first novel. And uh, this was while they were at 82 Washington Place. But no sooner had Alexander's Bridge been published than Willa and Edith moved on. They moved to Bank Street to Five Bank Street, not, alas, to the building that you see in this photo. This is the building that replaced the townhouse in which Willa and Edith took an apartment that they loved. It was actually a slightly cheaper apartment than 82 Washington Place. It wasn't modern. It had gas light, not electric light, when they moved in in 1912. Um, but they loved the character of the place. They loved the proportions of the rooms. They loved the woodwork. And they felt at home in Five Bank Street. So why am I showing you a picture of the building that replaced Five Bank Street? Because I can't find a picture of Five Bank Street. And if you're thinking, oh, he's probably just not looked hard enough, let me tell you, I'm by profession an architectural historian, and many of you don't know that that's simply a fancy word for picture researcher. Uh, I, 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 you know, uh, I know where to look for pictures. Uh, so can't find one. Um, but there is a plaque on the building that replaced Five Bank Street. And by the way, the demolition and replacement of Five Bank Street was the only reason that Willa and Edith ever moved out of Five Bank Street. But there's a plaque on the current building saying that on this site lived Willa 
Cather. Um, one thing we know about Five Bank Street, because Edith Lewis told us in her book, Willa Cather Living, which was published a few years after Willa died, that Willa found a large etching by Couture, Thomas Couture, of Georges Sand, and had it hung over the fireplace in the living room. This is the Sand picture, not the actual one, but it's a print, and this was what they would have had over their fireplace. Um, while uh, shortly after uh, Willa and Edith moved into Five Bank Street, Willa published an article in McClure's. She was still writing for McClure's, still doing magazine work, because as for all writers, it's a source of income. And she wrote a piece, still well worth reading, called Three American Singers, Louise Homer, Geraldine Farrar, and Olive Fremstad. And it was in the preparation of that piece that Willa, who was already a fan of the opera singer Olive Fremstad, befriended Olive. And it was Olive who became the model for the great character of Thea Kronborg in The Song of the Lark, which uh, is one of my favorite books of all time, published while Willa and Edith lived at Five Bank Street in 1915. Indeed, Five Bank Street was Willa's most productive address by far. Her greatest works were published while she and Edith lived there. Now, why, for many writers, is one address the most productive one? The poet Frank O'Hara had a theory that most writers do their best work in their worst apartment because it's a way of diverting their attention from their squalid surroundings. But this wasn't Willa's worst apartment. This was her favorite apartment, yet it is where she did her best work. This is as close as I could come. Five Bank Street, this is 1933, so Five Bank Street was gone, but we still see the block. It's, um, this is uh, opposite Waverly Place. And you see the row houses. I have an arrow pointing to 13 Bank Street. I note that it was the one-time home of Viola Roseboro. And that's how she spelled her name with that apostrophe after the final O. Um, Viola Roseboro was a great character in the literary culture of New York City in her day. Not for what she wrote, although she did write, but for her work as an editor, her work as a mentor, her work as a friend, and her role as a kind of woman about town. A largely, though not totally, forgotten figure. She was an editor at McClure's along with Willa. And by the way, Edith also worked at McClure's uh, as a proofreader and then later as an editor. Uh, but Willa and Viola knew each other quite well, and um, they also live uh, a few uh, doors apart. And there is a picture of the great Viola Roseboro. Now, a great friend of Edith's during this time, from McClure's days, when a young woman named Elizabeth Shepley Sargent uh, came to McClure's seeking to sell her work to McClure's, and Willa was her editor, and they formed a close bond, um, did these two women. Elizabeth Shepley Sargent, by the way, was the sister of Catherine Sargent, who became Catherine Sargent White, the wife of E.B. White, and also fiction editor at the New Yorker magazine and mother of the New Yorker writer Roger Angel. But um, Elizabeth Sargent, in her memoir of Willa Cather, uh, noted, um, talked about uh, how uh, Willa and Edith at Five Bank Street conducted a kind of weekly, we might call it salon or at home for their friends. Their friends were not the typical run of 
uh, big name village Bohemians. It was a somewhat more sedate bunch. You know, it wasn't it wasn't John Reed and Emma Goldman and Eugene O'Neill, uh, but rather um, one party that Elizabeth Sargent wrote about. The people who attended it included Willa's very close friend um, uh, from Pittsburgh, Isabel McClung. It also included Ida Tarbell, famous for her work for McClure's, though she had left her staff writer position at McClure's before Willa began there. Nonetheless, the two women did become friends. Ferris Greenslet was Willa's editor at Houghton Mifflin, and he pretty much embodied the old, the old patrician, very wasp the world of American publishing. The painter Henry Martin Hoyt, um, who was a friend of Willa's, but who at a very young age committed suicide. He was the brother of the poet Eleanor Wiley. And this is about as close uh, friendship with Eleanor Wiley as Willa came to sort of hobnobbing in the sort of bright lights world of village Bohemia because Eleanor Wiley was a very well-known figure in village uh, Bohemia. Dorothy Canfield Fisher was a good friend of Willa's during this period and for many years thereafter, uh, somebody who had Nebraska ties and who was a very famous writer of in the time. And so too was Zoe Aikens, the playwright, a close friend of Willa's. When Zoe sent poems to McClure's, Willa read them, wrote back to Zoe and suggested that instead of being a poet, she try her hand at writing plays. So Zoe did and became one of the major playwrights of her generation. And two other people who could be found at Willa's and Edith's at homes or salons were Alfred Knopf and his wife Blanche Wolf Knopf. Um, Alfred Knopf um, was a very different publisher from Houghton Mifflin. Houghton Mifflin was very old school. Alfred Knopf was part of the rising generation of Jewish publishers in New York who were completely remaking the publishing world. In Alfred Knopf's way of remaking the world, it involved two things. One, um, a deep seriousness about literature, but also a willingness, and this appealed mightily to Willa, to sell books. Because publishing as it had been practiced in New York and Boston from the beginnings of the Republic up to, say, the 1910s, was such a genteel business that book publishers thought it in bad taste to advertise books. The new publishers in New York, um, whether it be Horace Livewright, or Bennett Cerf, or Alfred A. Knopf, believed that books could be marketed. And uh, as a consequence, uh, Edith shifted publishers. She moved from Houghton Mifflin to Alfred A. Knopf and remained with Knopf for the rest of her life. She knew she worked with Knopf and visited Knopf offices at Knopf's first three homes, beginning at the Candler Building on 42nd Street, moving on to the Heckscher Building on 5th Avenue and 57th Street, and then finally at 501 Madison Avenue at 52nd Street. Knopf published My Mortal Enemy. This is a novella, as we say, a short novel, basically a prologue and two acts. The first of the two acts is set in New York City and it is set in Madison Square, where, um, and it's about a couple named um, uh, Myra and Oswald 
Henshaw, who are um, sort of living the life. They live on Madison Square. They are sort of thick in the cultural world of New York. Their friends are singers and writers and actors, and they have parties in their home. They, as things happen in the story, meet a very bad end, and goodness knows it's a depressing book, but also a very great book. But what for me is um, of importance in relation to the theme of Willa Cather in New York are her descriptions of Madison Square during this time. The book takes place in the year 1900, and a young woman from Parthia, Illinois, uh, comes to visit um, her cousin Myra in New York. Her name is Nellie Birdseye. She's never been to New York. But when she sees Madison Square, this is how she reacts. Madison Square was then at the parting of the ways, had a double personality, half commercial, half social, with shops to the south and residences to the north. It seemed to me so neat after the raggedness of our western cities, so protected by good manners and courtesy, like an open-air drawing room. I could well imagine a winter dancing party being given there, or a reception for some distinguished European visitor. And Willa, you know, was able to write about New York this way. Willa, coming to New York from Nebraska via Pittsburgh, looked at New York in this wide-eyed way. She didn't have the cynicism about New York that the New York native Edith Wharton had. Edith Wharton hated New York. Willa Cather loved New York. And this comes out very clearly in the books. This is Madison Square in 1893. Madison Square Garden, referenced in My Mortal Enemy, is there. But when My Mortal Enemy takes place, no flat iron building yet. No metropolitan life tower yet. Uh, the thing that dominates the skyline is the high tower of Madison Square Garden. And Myra and Oswald live, we're told, in, a, in an apartment on the second, a beautiful apartment, on the second floor of a brownstone house on the north side of Madison Square, roughly where uh, Chelsea Clinton now lives. Uh, anyway, uh, here we see Madison Square in a photo which is usually dated 1900. Um, and we see right across the street the Fifth Avenue Hotel, which is so memorable from Edith Wharton's novella, New Year's Day, but which is also where Nellie Birdseye and her Aunt Lydia stay when they come to New York in My Mortal Enemy. And here we see one of those Fifth Avenue horse stages that is mentioned in Coming Aphrodite, but here we see it at Madison Square with the Seward statue visible on the right. And here we see Cafe Martin, uh, a restaurant which uh, Nellie Birdseye dines in, in My Mortal Enemy. Um, Willa gets it a little wrong because um, Cafe Martin opened in um, 1902. So it's not congruent with all of the other clues that firmly set my mortal enemy in the year 1900. But, you know, well, she's not a historian, she's a novelist, we'll let her have it. Um, um, Willa spent Christmas Eve of 1906. Edith Lewis wasn't around. She was off visiting family or something, and Willa spent Christmas Eve with two of fellow staffers from McClure's. One of them was Viola Roseboro. The other was Will Irwin. And they went to dinner that night at Cafe Martin. Um, Will Irwin, we know, that year, in a letter to his girlfriend, said of Willa Cather, uh, 
Miss Cather has the lesbian in her which repels me, so I am ill at ease with her. Yikes. Well, um, Will Irwin was paranoid. He was the managing editor of McClure's, and he thought Willa was after his job. And no sooner had he said, Miss Cather has the lesbian in her, than he began to fantasize that Willow was having an affair with S.S. McClure as part of her way to get Will Irwin's job. Well, eventually, for whatever reason, Willow got Will Irwin's job. And here we see the block that the Henshaws live on, 26th Street between 5th Avenue and Madison Avenue. A character who appears briefly in My Mortal Enemy is the great actress Helena Mojeska, a Polish actress who came to America and uh, who was really considered one of the great theatrical personages of the era. She was also um, the model in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's mind for Irene Adler, great love. Anyway, she appears at a party of the Henshaws on New Year's Eve. And uh, she says, uh, this is from My Mortal Enemy, 1926, when Oswald asked her to propose a toast, she put out her long arm, Jessica did, lifted her glass, and looking into the blur of the candlelight with a grave face said, to my country, in a Polish accent, okay? Susan Sontag wrote a novel in 1999 called In America, which is about Helena Mojeska. And some people noticed that this passage appears in Sontag's novel. When asked to propose a toast, she put out her long arm, lifted her glass, and looking into the blur of the candlelight, crooned to my new country. So, you know, the internet erupted, and Susan Sontag was said to be a plagiarist. Sontag said, for her own part, that she deliberately did that, so uh, that uh, as a as a sort of inside joke, so that readers of My Mortal Enemy would get it right away. Well, I believe her. Uh, Majeska's nephew was W.T. Benda, a wonderful illustrator whose works appeared in McClure's while Willow was its editor and later in a magazine called Every Week when Edith Lewis was its managing editor and whom Willa handpicked to be the illustrator of My Antonia. So the wonderful engravings in My Antonia are by uh, Helena Mojeska's nephew. In My Mortal Enemy, uh, references made, uh, Nellie Birdseye goes to see Sarah Bernhardt perform as Hamlet. Bernhardt performed as Hamlet uh, at, the, not as Ophelia, as Hamlet at the Garden Theater uh, in November, December 1900. And we're also told that Jean de Reshka, the most famous tenor in the world, at the time, had just returned from illness to perform um, at the Met, and, and this was on New Year's Eve, 1900. And there is a portrait of Willa Cather by Edward Steichen from 1927, which is the year that Five Bank Street was demolished and Willa and Edith had to move yet again, and they moved they stayed in the village, and they moved to Fifth Avenue and Tenth Street uh, to a building that has literary fame, not only because Willa Cather once lived in it, but this is the home of Felicity in the TV show, Felicity. You remember that show in the late 90s? That was the show that led to this unbelievable surge in undergraduate applications to NYU. Believe it or not, it's true. Anyway, they lived here in what was known as the Grosvenor from 1927 to 1932. This is the view I showed you before uh, from the era of coming Aphrodite. 
the view through the arch. By the time they had moved to the Grosvenor on Fifth Avenue, the view was different. There were high rises, like one Fifth Avenue, which you see in this picture. And this is something that was written in that year, 1927, by Edmund Wilson. And this will be my last quote, and then we're almost done. But Edmund Wilson, the great literary critic, said, the big red houses of the north and west sides had already been gutted of their grandeurs and crammed with economized cells. He's lamenting the old days of the village. The cubby holes of modern apartments and the sooty peeling fronts of the south side with their air of romance and mystery had already been replaced by fresh, arty grays and pinks. And now, in the short months of summer, there had been erected on Lower Fifth Avenue two monstrous apartment houses, one just south of the Brevoort Hotel, that's 1-5th Avenue, and the other between 10th and 11th Streets, that's the Grosvenor, where Willa Cather had just taken an apartment. They loom over the village like mountains, and they have already changed its proportions. Their effect is to crush in the Washington Arch and in the row of red facades behind it, whatever these had formerly kept of chaste elegance and decorous pride. The whole village seems now merely a base for these cubic apartment buildings. I'll stop with the quote right there. These apartment buildings are for many of us today part of the old village, but they certainly weren't when they were new. Um, the building was right across the street from Church of the Ascension. Willa was a church-going Episcopalian, and she particularly loved Lafarge's mural in that church. Then she and Edith moved to 570 Park Avenue in 1932 at 63rd Street, which tells you something, does it not? Willa was becoming pretty well off. She was never Edith Wharton well off. Edith Wharton was a one percenter. Uh, but Willa Cather was well enough off that they could take a not prime apartment in a prime building. And they did. And this is where Willa died in 1947. When Willa lived in the village, she made extensive use of the New York Society Library at that time on University Place. And when she moved uptown, so did the New York Society Library, where she continued to use it. And some of you may know that the very, very last thing that Truman Capote ever wrote before he died, he was working on it the day before he died, was a remembrance of when he was a young man in New York, not yet known, not yet published. He encountered an older woman outside the New York Society Library on 79th Street. It was raining, and she was trying to hail a cab unsuccessfully. He then tried to hail a cab for her unsuccessfully, and instead, walked her home. En route home, they stopped, the two of them, strangers to each other, into a Longchamps restaurant for a cup of tea. Only Capote had a martini. Anyway, uh, they started talking. And this last piece that Truman Capote wrote, he recounts his meeting with this woman. She asked him, what do you do? He said, I'm a writer. She said, what writers do you like? And he told her, and she said, really? She, really, what writers did I admire? Obviously, she was not a New Yorker. She had a Western accent. He said, I admire Flaubert, Turgenev, Proust, Dickens, Forster, Conan Doyle, Maupassant. She laughed. Well, you certainly are varied, except aren't there any American writers you cared for? Like who, Capote said. She didn't hesitate. Sarah Orange. Martin. Miss Jewett, Capote said, wrote one good book, The Country of the Pointed Furs. Edith Wharton wrote one good book, The House of Mirth. But I like Henry James, Mark Twain, Melville, and I love Willa Cather, My Antonia, Death Comes for the Archbishop. Have you read her two marvelous novellas, A Lost Lady and My Mother? 
enemy? Yes, said the woman. She sipped her tea and put the cup down with a slightly nervous gesture. She seemed to be turning something over in her mind. I ought to tell you, she paused, then in a rushing voice, more or less whispered, I wrote those books. Capote then said he accompanied her to the door of her apartment building. She said to him, I expect you for dinner next Thursday. The next Thursday, he shows up for dinner. That's where Capote left off writing. Then Capote died. So we never got Capote's account of having dinner with Willa Cather and Edith Lewis on Park Avenue. Now, is this story true? It's Truman Capote. So who knows? Nonetheless, what a marvelous thing it is that this was the last thing that Truman Capote wrote. And by the way, it was published, the little excerpt, uh, the little uh, sketch, the bit that had been already written uh, in Vanity Fair in 2006. And it is on this note that I think I had better shut up because I've used up my allotted time and we've gotten up to Park Avenue. And what I hope is at the very least, if you haven't read Coming Aphrodite or My Mortal Enemy or anything else by Willa Cather, you now will because uh, she not only was, in my view, the great American novelist, but when she did write about New York and she did in several stories besides that I did not mention, she wrote about it as well as anybody has ever written about it. I thank you all very much for coming tonight and hope to see you all again. Thank you. Thank you, Francis, so much. That was wonderful. And to the almost 200 people who are here with us, thank you all very, very much. Have a sweet night. And we hope to see you again soon. And my apologies for the sound problems. Oh, that's, that's okay. Everybody, everybody seems, our, our feedback is good so far. So I'm very, I'm very grateful. That's never true. Most of the chat comments are nasty. <laughs> well, thank anyway, thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you, you, Ariel. Yeah, thanks again. Take good care. You too.